uh, just because you got to take classes uh, to graduate outside your, your major. I said, wow, there's a science to separating people from their money. This is pretty cool. Uh, and uh, uh, it's sort of like exposing your kids to everything. I never knew I wanted to go to business school. I thought I wanted to be an engineer. Right. Uh, but I took this one class and I said, this is what I want to do. Having a daughter just having recently graduated from college in the last 10 years, I'm guessing? Right. We, we came out of college in those days. I came out of college in 76. We didn't really take anything seriously for the last month because we were having a good time in college, right? <laughs> We didn't worry about Breakpoint. We didn't worry about a lot of the stuff that the yeah. kids were worried about. Because in my case, I want to be a journalist, so I started very early. I was fortunate enough to have my, my, my life profession there. Right. But that said, even if I didn't have that, I still wouldn't. These four kids in college now are so concerned about interviews and jobs and Breakpoints and all the rest of the high school kids are that way. Well, I think the real problem is them getting into a college. For us, it was yeah. easy to get into a college. Absolutely. You take a kid that's got roughly the same amount of A's and B's on a report card. They have nice test scores. They're just in there with a couple hundred thousand other kids. You need to have something special about you to get in these schools. Now, once you get in these schools, uh, then they do just as well as those kids with four points once they get there. Uh, so I think there's the real problem is that uh, these kids have to go through so much to get into a school. There's a lot of pressure. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that they take it that much more seriously once they get there, uh, but it's certainly more serious than we did. So from Eastern, you say, I'm assuming you sell this all from your Eastern. Well, I actually we had a real small sailing program at Eastern. That, uh, we had two boats, and I actually spent more time down there coaching and helping uh, with the program that I did racing myself. Uh, that um, when I was in uh, college, uh, far better shape than I am now, but you know, I was six foot two and 235 pounds. Well, I gotta tell you, you gotta find yourself an 80 pound crew if you're gonna sail a flying junior right. and that kind of thing. So the bigger kids really didn't have anything to sail. Uh, and uh, so uh, I just raced a little bit. Uh, but I did more helping the program, and, and quite honestly, most of the sailing in the Midwest is um, party-oriented with regards. Whereas on the East Coast, it tends to be the focus is on the sailing and less the party. Why? I, I don't know, but I actually think that the uh, MCSA has a better formula. Uh, that with all the pressure that these kids have everywhere else, just go on and do something that's fun. Uh, is probably good for them. The acronym you mentioned, M yes, and Michigan, our Midwest, um, let's see, this week, Midwest Collegiate. Let's say the the yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Sometimes when I talk to people from other places, they know how good the better centers are. They are our top of the guys are the top of the guys in any place in the country. Right. But I don't know that if you talk to some of the folks on both coasts, and I've done had a chance to interview them in the show, the sort of the, that, that echelon level, below that. Maybe he doesn't get the credit. And I think what I found from the series is there's a lot of sailors out there on this lake that are first class, I mean, international level kind of sailors. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of our club level racers can go race against the club race level racers anywhere in the country. And our best guys are as good as anybody in the country. We don't have quite as many as some areas, uh, uh, Annapolis, uh, Newport, Southern California have more really good sailors, but our best guys can sail with them. But that's, just, that's like, you know, that's the bastion of I mean, Newport, San Diego, to some extent, certainly. Well, in you know, other places, I'll tell you what else it is, is that we've got absolutely fantastic junior programs in the area. And uh, our high school sailings are phenomenal. But what happens is these kids go off to college, and then they end up getting jobs on either coast. So what we're doing is we're populating sailing centers all over the country, and those kids aren't coming back to sail. And it's because the opportunities are greater. I know our, our son graduated from Michigan State, and uh, he was in uh, computer engineering, architectural uh, structure, a front-end software type thing. And he interviewed for a few guys in Detroit. And he had some guys with interest, but about one of them doing, he didn't have a job. So he went out and visited his sister in California, and the first week he had eight interviews and two job offers. Uh, and he got a good job. And the problem is, is Detroit can't compete with that. So our best sailors that come out of junior sailing programs and go out to colleges aren't coming back. Yeah. 
we've had a couple in our program last year. Kenny Walton is out east on he's taking his internship in, but first class, I mean, he's a very good collegiate sailor. And that's, you know, so you get some really good kids coming back and teaching. And John, I, Johnny Walton's a good example of a kid that, that in a top-notch sailing program could be as good as anybody. He's got natural talent. His dad was an excellent sailor. Uh, it's in the genes. And the kid's got the right attitude. Yeah. Uh, so uh, his potential is unlimited. He's a hard worker kid, too, really. Yeah. He's also the one out, he's the last one off the, off the lake. You know, mm -hmm. when, when, when the classes break down last summer and everybody goes out sailing, He's the last one in. Yeah. And that, that says a lot. You know, we're, we're fortunate they have some of those kids. And all of the clubs are, are able to do that. I'm really curious, at that age, say high school through college, what was your favorite boat to sail? Well, you know, I actually was wandering around the parking lot here and I saw a Thomas that was out, uh, out here. And they were the cool keel boat because they were a keel boat that had trap pieces. We had a nice fleet in Detroit. Uh, we, uh, we generally travel to the bigger regattas, and we go to the Olympic trials and that type of thing. So I like sailing the Flying Dutchman. I sail the Finn a little bit. I uh, sail the Tempest. Uh, I like sailing those kind of boats. It's funny. Some of the guys on the coast were all talking about scouts. And I guess yeah. you know the Connors and the Jobsons and some of those guys. They just for some reason like the A scouts and the B scouts. I'm not sure why that is, but the sailing at the scout, a scout is a pretty incredible experience. It, it, it sort of stepped down from those Australia 18s, but they're 65 feet long, right. and they're very cool. Um, and we just don't have a lot of scouts sailing around here. Scouts are best when the waves are less than two feet. So you see them in the little looks. I've learned that weight on a boat, especially in the 420s and smaller, some of the smaller boats. I was, I'm watching star videos on YouTube, okay. and without track and I'm watching these guys over the edge, and I'm thinking, when I was maybe 20, I could back up, but if I had gotten the wrong position, and at this point, taking one of our stars out, and going, I'd never get back up, I didn't end up in the water. So it, it, it had to be pretty athletic to be a sailor at that level, too. Well, the star's pretty interesting in, in that uh, when you're out there, it's really comfortable. And you've got this little hiking harness that you hang on to that takes the weight. The problem is, is every single time you attack, it's, you got to do a sit-up, like hold it away. Right. <laughs> you know, for a guy like myself, I still start for one day, but a three-day regatta, it's just going to kill me. <laughs> well, <laughs> not, 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 <laughs> exactly. Of course, I can find it. I think mean, we both share, you know, I'm a large guy as well. Yeah, so. I mean, that, that, that's for somebody that's uh, 50 or younger. Eastern Michigan, you decided you're going to go out west? And well, I, I got a school in Detroit for a guy. Good job offers from a number of people. I ended up accepting one from Chrysler. And my first assignment was in a little town at the north of the uh, bay, a town called Venetia. Uh, so that's how I ended up there, and, and I liked it there. What, uh, what is it like about Northern California? Because you know there's a big huge difference between Northern California and Southern California. Well, you know, at that age, uh, it's an adventure. Uh, and I haven't traveled around that much. And, just uh, leave Michigan and head off to California was exciting. So I think I've been excited about Southern California. I was excited about Northern California. Obviously, the climate's pretty cool there. Uh, that uh, There were a number of times when I raced sailboats on a Saturday, went skiing on a Sunday. Uh, so uh, it's a pretty special place out there. There's no wonder it's popular. When you first moved there, you got to sail in love. Where, did, where, where was the first place you migrated to? Did you go to St. Francis? Where did you go? Well, St. Francis, because I had friends there. And it, it's an interesting thing about these junior sailors is that you end up going around the country sailing these junior regattas. So that they all end up making friends that we did back then from all over the country. Right. So what do you do when you get to a new town? The first thing you do is call somebody you know. You know. How long did it to take them to figure out, you're from the Midwest, how long did it take them to figure out that you pretty much knew what you were doing? Well, the, most of them knew because I'd sailed against them all. Right? Okay, so you had a reputation for right. what, what kind of boats did you sail out in St. Louis Quebec? Because it's a different sailing. Mostly big boats. I mean, I sailed uh, 505 a little bit, but I was a little big for that. And um, I did sail some stars, uh, but mostly uh, uh, boats in the 35 to 50 foot. Uh, PHRF type boats at that time we used to have another rule called IOR, but they're the same kind of boats they're out here on a Saturday. Explain what you think about the San Diego or San Francisco Bay as far as the, the difficulty of sailing that place. Well, I think it's hard because of the currents. 
Uh, but what's pretty cool about it is you can almost always sail in the afternoon. I mean, there are a lot of races where at 10 o'clock in the morning, we had the leg number one up and we did the first race and we did the first leg uh, with the, uh, the leg number one, and by the finish, we had a three up. Uh, so it's very consistent sailing, and I love sailing a big breeze. I always like sailing a big breeze. I just get the feeling that if we can get the right setup and we can just muscle the boat around the course, uh, that we can win. And uh, uh, if you like big breeze, that's a place to sail. It yeah. is. And with wind coming out of that bridge, when you get gusts there, they're, they're really yeah. legitimate gusts. Right. One of the cool things in San Diego was that at 12 o'clock every day, prevailing at 11 knots came up every day, 352 days a year, except for the San Antonio in the other direction. So you always knew that at 1230, you could end up on your boat, and if you didn't want to go out to the ocean, you still had this huge bay to sail on. And it was the most consistent, place I've ever been. So for not the quality of which you are, that for somebody like me, that's, that's almost perfect. I love San Diego, and you're right. The breeze came up and kind of fades to the right as the day goes on. Yeah. And it, 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 it's a great place to sail. The water's cold there. I don't think a lot of people know that. Uh, San Francisco, obviously, the breeze can be anywhere, but as it comes up, it lines up with the entrance to the bay. Yeah. Uh, I actually San Diego is maybe a better place to race because in, uh, you generally have to be going right, uh, but it's not a panic to get there. We're in San Francisco, you've got little ribbons of current. They're sometimes only 100 yards wide, and you absolutely have to sail, either out of the foul or with the good. And so often in uh, San Francisco, this best strategy is just to sit in somebody's dirt and go the right way. Uh, and get up to the next mark and a chance to move up. Whereas in San Diego, you might be able to work the little shifts and that type of thing, but the current becomes pretty dominant in San Francisco. In interviewing Dennis Conner, who's lived literally 1,500 feet from the bay his entire life, yeah. he was talking about the bay before the Navy had come in. This was after the Second World War, and before they dredged it. And it was a very shallow, very rocky, very unforgiving sailing bay because it hadn't been. So the only thing I knew was the San Diego Bay when I moved out there in the 80s. I knew the San Diego Bay from what it now, but he's explaining that it was not unusual to stick the boat in the mud in, in, in a real simple process. He said a couple of times, you know, he said, you come around, you take it, you think we're in deep water, and all of a sudden the boat stops in, in the center. California's a little bit different than I think some of the rest of the United States, but I think you get prevailing, it makes a big difference. There's plenty of great places to sail. Uh, you know, maybe one of the nicest places to sail in this country uh, is uh, Florida in, in, in the wintertime, Biscayne Bay. Uh, the breeze is not uh, high yeah. uh, in San Francisco, but it's pretty consistent. Every afternoon you get the uh, uh, sea breeze. Uh, that uh, As the sea breeze comes in, it kind of lines up with uh, the entrance, uh, maybe to the left of the entrance a little bit. It's just a pleasurable place to sail. How long were you in California? Uh, about a year and a half. And then I got transferred down to Plano, Texas, which is a, a little town just north of, uh, of Dallas. Uh, and I worked there for less than six months, so then I got transferred back to Detroit. You know, when, you, when you're a young guy and you're working on a little industry, uh, they move you around a bunch. Sure. Is there any sailing in Plano? Uh, sailing what? Is there any sailing in Plano? Yes, it's, it's this lake, great flying, lakes, uh, sand covered, uh, uh, for kind of, there's a third lake. Uh, you know, boats like J-22s and that type of thing race there. Uh, reservoir type lakes, uh, but uh, the surprising amount of sailing. So, being transferred back to Detroit, you're roughly how old at that point? Uh, by the time I get back to Detroit, probably 25. Okay. Family and tell me, you're married yet? No. Nope. So, just career changing, kind of coming back. Okay. So, you came back to Detroit. You can take us the next five or six or ten So, years. I get back to Detroit, and uh, almost immediately after getting back to Detroit, I got laid off from Chrysler. You know, I'm thinking, geez, you guys paid for my graduate school, you had me on a nice track, and here we go, you get laid off. So I went to work for a guy named Roger Gamache who had a, um, a hood sail off here in Detroit. And uh, I worked for him for about six months. And Roger said, uh, yeah, I want to get out of this thing. He said, why don't you just do this? And I, I said, all right, well, yeah, I can do this. But then I saw this company, North Sales, coming up. And Hood had been the real champion so far at Sailmakers. They're the biggest company in the world. Uh, they were on all the high boats, but this North Company was applying technology 
that was really pretty special and new to the game in terms of software and mm -hmm. engineering and materials. And I said, well, geez, if I'm going to be in the semi business, why do I want to be in the old one? You know, I want to work for SpaceX. Uh, uh, you know, so um, uh, I talked to the guys at North and started the North Loft in Detroit. Wow. In those, you guys sound like you're most of your life, right? What have been the biggest technological changes over the last 30 years? And what specifically were those changes? Shape has always been shape. Is that fair to say? Well, if we can, shapes have changed some. Okay. Um, and we can achieve shapes that we couldn't achieve before because the materials weren't strong enough. So, uh, a, a couple of things. One is shape has changed because uh, uh, as boats change, certainly the, the type of uh, shape that's right on a Cal 25 is not the same uh, shape that's right on a you know, Melchus 37 type thing. So, you need different shapes for different boats. Uh, and the materials as they improved allowed us to get better shapes. But you know, from a design standpoint, when I first started at North, we had this uh, uh, teletype machine that actually, you, you keyed it in like a typewriter, it made a little tape. And we would feed this tape into the general electric information system at night, because after seven o'clock, we paid less for the computer time. Right. And the next morning, our designer would be printed out there. And Algorithms were being used those kinds of things. Right. So and that's what, what drove me to North because they were on that process. The problem was is that you look at this and it wasn't quite right. So then you do another run the next day and finally about three days later you're actually ready to build the same. So we buy this computer that's called a Kermenko from a company in the made in San Francisco, but there was something they had that sold. And they're literally like this right. big, and they got that big disc in it, about as powerful as your watch today, right. uh, for $25,000. So $25,000 uh -huh. uh, back in 1980 uh, was, I don't know, maybe it's 100000 now. Yeah. But I can see it was the future. And then, in an hour, I could do more runs on designs than I could in a week uh, through this older way of doing it. It, it was non-stop from that point on. A couple of years later, IBM came out with those ET computers and, and it just got better and better. So that, uh, the, the computers and software are one thing. The materials, um, in terms of first going to Kevlar, then going to carbon and spectra and that type of things were good, but the whole back then was the adhesives. And you might remember that sales used to delaminate, fall apart. Because some of these materials are very hard to glue together. And when you glue things, you would like to get both a chemical and a, me and a mechanical bond. Well, if you use two different types of materials, chances are you can't get a, mechan uh, a chemical bond, so now you're left with strictly mechanical. So it's not that easy. So the biggest thing that's happened in the last maybe 10 years is that adhesives have gotten a lot better. The processes uh, for gluing things have gotten a lot better. How much of sale design is, has gone from subjective to objective? And maybe a better way of saying it is we designed it forever, however we did it, they may end up with CADs and computers. And is, it, is it prior to your same point, or is it, is it sort of every year it's sort of changing? You know, the first computer software programs were what we call tin sale programs, in that uh, you would design a sale under the assumption that it wasn't going to stretch when the wind pressurized it. Uh, and what we would end up doing is we called it leading the software or lines of the software. We would input a shape with the uh, draft further forward and we would input a flatter shape. And then when the sail actually pressurized it and the material stretched, we'd get the flying shape we wanted. Uh, then we had these memory programs which would do that for us and make the adjustments. Uh, uh, now, uh, we're using software that's actually tied to VPP programs where we're modeling the boats and we're actually sailing the boats with various shapes. Um, Real world experience. Yeah, and it is pretty accurate. Uh, you know, we got to get sails to trim around rigs and, and, and those types of things. So uh, uh, it's pretty complex now. But uh, when I go out sailing on a boat now, we can sail up. I expect it to be perfect. There might be a little detail that's wrong or something. In the old days, 15 years ago, and worse, earlier than that, we 
expected to bring every sale back we made for a little tweak or a little tailor. You know, that just isn't the case anymore. Okay. So, does everybody have the same technology? The good guys all do. Okay. If that's true, what's the difference between you and X company here and X company there? Well, I think there's a lot of good companies, and um, uh, generally, every city has the best company that you should do business with. Uh, in one city, it might be uh, a UK loft, and another it might be North, and another it might be Doyle. Uh, the reality is there's some s specific classes and specific types of sales where a given sale maker at the time could have an edge over another sale maker. Mm -hmm. But who you want to do business with is the best person to do business with in your city. And if that happens to be North guy, that's where you want to go. That's and, and so, uh, the other thing is, is that um, uh, for every customer, the same sale off might not be the best one. Okay. So you know, we've got four sale offs in the city. All of them could make an argument as to why you ought to do business. Uh, and you know, uh, I think that what I bring to the table is the ability to talk with you and figure out how you're going to use your boat today how you might be using it in the next couple of years, uh, and the type of sales that are going to be the most best value and also meet your expectations. Once we sort that out, well, it's real easy for me to tell you whether you ought to do a panel sale or some type of a string sale or whether it ought to be carbon or whether it ought to be spectra, how durable versus fast, those types of things. But the initial discussion is the whole deal. Once you and I know what's best for you, well, coming up with the solutions easy. Yeah, ten customers. Is the sale look the, the way you design it the first question, or is the money the first question? You know, neither one. Okay. Okay. So what I want to know is that like last year, how did you use your boat? And we figure out that you used it eighty percent of the time day sailing. You might have taken one long trip up to the North Channel. Maybe you sailed in two club races. Okay, somebody else never left the dock to do anything other than sail the race. So I like to figure out one out of people are currently using their boats, and if they see any change in that. Now, if you're in a race, we can build you a $2,000 sale, or we can build you a $4,500 sale. Surely a $4,500 sale is going to win you more races. But if you can't afford the $4,500 sale, what we want to do is build you the best possible sale we can for $2,000 to help you accomplish your objectives. I asked that question, I asked that of, of, we've had a, a, several sale members on the show. I'm asking that question because I think there's a lot more people like me than maybe competitive racers who will come to you. The point was, last year I made a new sales. Okay. Called everybody, got prices, we had a very specific budget, went online and got them from, you know, out in California. If I had known what I know now, I would say, I would call you, I would call whomever that you know that I have made a deal with. I'd have bought them all. Not because they were good sales, but they had people look at them and go, oh, okay, they're adequate. Right. They're for what I paid, they're adequate. But for literally not that much more money, I would have handled it. And then I'd have had somebody that could have tweaked the boat, get on the boat, those kind of things. But I think you want to uh, you know, after sales support as well. It, you know, I'll see somebody and they say, well, I bought my number three from Almond, and I bought my main from North, and I bought my spare from Thorne. Well, now what you are is a somewhat small customer to all three companies. Mm -hmm. They've been way smarter to buy all three from the same guy and become a partner. You know, I partner up with our customers, and we're going to be your sale maker for the next eight years type thing. You'll get more benefit out of that. Mm -hmm. It'll be better for me, uh, and we work together to help you achieve your objectives. And that's what I encourage to everybody. And if you get in a partnership with your sale maker and you're not convinced that this is what you want to do for the next five years, switch. Right. Now, I ski for Fisher, okay. and I have for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I go to those pro shows in, in the end of March at the point. Right. And again, these are clearly better. But I have to look down and see Fisher. When I don't see Fisher, it just doesn't see my own. <laughs> so part of it's in my head. I mean, there's no doubt about it. There's, no, there's loyalty because they've been good to me. Part of it is like, well, it's just not, it's just not Fisher. It doesn't do this in high speeds. It does. 
because they're all filled with skis the same way. Right. Especially the race skis, so it doesn't change the next But technological advancement is, is literally what used to be 20 years ago was every five years, is now literally every summer. Right. So that changes your job, and I think you, have to, you adapt and, and do those kinds of things. North, then to how did Doyle get involved? How did uh, Robbie Doyle get involved? No, you said you, you went to North at one point? Right. So I, I worked for North for nine years and it, it was interesting that we, we started up the loft and I owned 48 percent of it, Lowell North owned uh, 52 percent and I met with Lowell and Lowell said, how much money do you think it's going to take for us to get through the first year? And uh, I said, I don't know, 45, 50 thousand dollars. So Lowell said, well how much money do you have? I said, 2,500 dollars. <laughs> so now I'm expecting in this conversation that Wolves going to own 90% of this thing and I'm going to um, uh, own 10% of this thing. If the conversation goes well, we talked a little longer. He said, I'll tell you what, you put your 2500 bucks in and I'll put in the rest and I'll own 52% and you'll own 48%. Fair guy. Fair guy. So about a year later, we were very successful. And business was good. And I said, well, how do you know? He said, your 2500 bucks meant more to you than my $48,000 uh, did. And I knew while you were working your ass off for your 2500 my money would be going for the ride. Wow. He, as a racer, go back, and we talked earlier before we started about the 74 America's Cup between yeah. he and Ted Turner and, right. and Ted Hood. He was... I don't know that he was a real charismatic guy. He wasn't thought of in, in the light of other racers at that. Is that a fair point? He was a fairly quiet guy, and he wasn't into the bar scene and, and that type of thing. Uh, he was technically very innovative. And, and Ted Hood, by the way, uh, you know, built his business based on that as well. Uh, that uh, uh, he had best sale clock. And when he had best sale clock, he could build the best sales. Well, then Lowell came along and said, there would be a better way of building consistent shapes. And Lowell uh, started this process of using software. And that's what kind of separated him out from the group. In 74, Sale Magazine had a, a New York yacht club was looking to get rid of uh, Lowell North any way they could during the race. They wanted to dismiss it to figure out how to do it. And they finally got it on the, on the second month with the way that the process was. And they kind of, if you read the story, Leaves you he's a really good guy, and your stories obviously point out that. But he, he wasn't the face that U.S. Sailors wanted at the time for, for America. So well, he was from California, and he wasn't the Yacht Club. Okay. And you know, I, I remember sailing the Canada Cup, set of trials here in Detroit, our book called the rest of two. And Bayview was running, running the trials, and uh, we were from Gross Point Yacht Club. We had the best club, we had the best crew. Our record was 35 and 8. And three of those races, we had breakdowns. So no other boat had a record of better than 500. Golden Daisy beat us two races in a row at the end. They called the trials. Obviously, they've shown progress. They're the boat. You know, we were on the outside looking at it. Well, in those days, if you weren't the New York Yacht Club boat, you were on the outside looking at it. There was a cool part of the story that said that Lowell knew he was in trouble because the boat was coming into the dock. The guys that were part of the uh, organizing committee had red blazers and they wore these little black and white, um, I guess we call them now hip hop caps, little kind of sort of suburban hats that these guys were wearing. He says, when you never saw those guys, you know, it was the same guys that had been there since 1911, you know, right. sense. He said, when you saw those guys coming towards you, you knew it was never going to be a good advice. <laughs> it was always going to be a bad situation. So he said, they come around the corner, there's there's four of them standing there waiting for them to come around where the spot was. And he said, you after that, didn't take the board out of the water. So it was just one of those, those opportunities. Right. From North then to Doyle? Well, actually, the UK. And UK it is pride. UK is Kent? No, no, UK is, uh, it was all Macaulay. I said, okay. okay. And when I was at North, right in, and they started uh, having these low pass sales. So rather than having tri radio type sales, where you might have five angle changes in the materials to line up the strongest access of the materials with the strongest loads of the sale. 
you had these continuous path cells where the fiber would actually curve along that path. And UK had this kind of cool but simple uh, system called tape drive. And I'm at North and I'm thinking to myself, I can build these sails affordably, and these are going to be really good sails, and this is going to be the future. So I left North and started this UK loft. And everybody said, you're nuts. He said, you got the largest sail loft in the city. Everything's going good. You're dominating everything. But I knew, and, and what I knew is that the sails we were building North at the time had become really expensive. And our customers didn't want to pay that price. And I could build those tape drive sales, deliver those sales at a price that was 25% lower. They would be very durable, and they would fit this market perfectly. Well, for all the guys that thought we were crazy, uh, within a year and a half, we were bigger than all the other guys put together. Did North's entry into retail, the hats and all of the sort of Ralph Lauren stuff, the, the, the jackets and all that, did that hurt them at all? I don't think so. You know, the, the clothing for North is big over in Europe right now, uh, bigger than selling I mean, in Europe. Uh, but there's a strong focus on sales, and you know, North is a really good company. Uh, North's issues for this market is pricing. Right. Uh, that uh, the, the quality product's good. I, mean, I worked there for a couple of years, and, and I was proud of the product. I was happy with what I was delivering. But for an apples to apples basis, the North pricing is 15 to 40 percent higher than say our price. Right. So at some point, if a guy buys his boat for $13,000 and I go and talk to him and tell him that the new Genoa for his boat is going to be $4,000, it's like I can't do that. Right. So that's why I went back to Doyle when, you know, I could have stayed and finished my career at North, uh, but I just didn't think it was a fit for today's market. The North's only a good fit for the high end of the sport. The typical club racer is going to be happier with a different choice. And, you know, this interview should never be about, you know, uh, slamming one company. They're, no, they're, 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 they're a great company. Absolutely. But I believe, like when I left North the first time and went to the UK, that Doyle was just going to be a better fit. And it's going to be easier. No, and, and your point of even now with Doyle changing is that you have to change the marketplace. Right. Um, I don't think there's anybody. It's funny because all of the other seminars basically have said the same thing. We have respect for the other guy. Price point does, I think, become important. And I'm saying that from my consumer standpoint. It was I had X amount of dollars to spend because this is how much I have to spend. I can't spend more than that. And we, we found a cylinder that, that, that goes to that. I wish, again, I think I'm overreacting to some of the having conversations with sale makers because I think there's a lot of people like me that do pick up the internet, travel down the road, and don't stay local when they should. And that's the mistake I make. I will never do that again. Right. So I think you're the biggest advantage to dealing with whoever you think is the best sale maker in your city. Well, in our case, we had a couple family members. Uh, I mentioned Tim Marcoy. I think Tim's, yes. you've made, I think, two or three sales for so right. Tim over the last and for his dad over the last 20 years. So it's just different for you to look at in this thing. Well, you know, we have a lot of customers that we've made one sale a year for them, every year for 25 years, 30 years, 35 years. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Do you have a favorite race story? Do you have one that sticks out when you, when you go to the bar and tell people that you remember when? Do you have one of those? Well, you know, there's a lot of good races and uh, that most sailors uh, have that favorite story. Uh, probably um, my favorite story is that we bought a boat called Bernita uh, that was our boat and won the first snack in our race in 1925. And when we got it, it was fit to go on a day sail. It wasn't fit to sail on a race, probably wasn't fit to sail on more than 10 miles an hour wind. So we, we buy this boat and uh, we get it in December and cover it up. And in the spring they go down and say, okay, it's time to get the, uh, uh, the cover off of it. Let's look at it. And I just said, God, how are we going to get this boat ready for the Mackinac race? So we'd plug away, we'd sail it, we'd break stuff, we'd make it stronger, we'd break stuff, we'd make improvements, uh, sailed in a couple of tune-up races, and finally got it to the starting line um, before the Mackinac. And the conditions are perfect for this boat. I mean, if I called God up on the phone and said, this is what I'd like you to do, uh, and we had a couple of sales on board that none of the guys in the class had and stuff. 
And you know, we set this code zero going off the starting line. Uh, and this is in 2012 when they weren't that prevalent. And we're going at not and a half faster than most in our class that gave us 30 seconds a mile. Now you wrote a book about this. Right. Right. Which was published? Uh, probably in uh, 2013. Okay. And you know, we, uh, we printed 3,500 of them. I think I still got a thousand of them, so it wasn't that popular. <laughs> Uh, but that was okay. Then we did a kids' book uh, that was uh, geared towards, uh, uh, say, six to ten-year-olds. We actually did a lot better on that book. I think we sold about ten thousand of those. Now this is a wooden book, right? And we found out North Pembroke, I want to say. Yeah, well, I actually got it from a guy named Emery Brunel, who had restored it up in Mack and Iowa, uh, and uh, you know, he, when he got it, he couldn't say it, and. He did a lot of things to fix it, but there's a difference between a boat that's strong enough to day sail in 10 knots of breeze and a boat that's strong enough to go race in 30 knots of breeze. Now you mentioned you gave away, you're a, a mile and a half faster, a mile and a half faster than right. boats you give up 30 seconds to. There's been some thought, and I'm saying this is just rumor of conversation, that maybe your handicap was a little better than everybody else. Is there any truth to that? Well, technically no, uh, but as it turns out, you know, we won that race uh, by, I believe, 12 hours. Uh, okay, so that's that. As, as I pointed out to one of my competitors that act, happens to keep his boat at Crescent, he says, well, your rating should have been this. I said, keep in mind, if our rating had been the same as equations, we still would be you. <laughs> so we won by so much, it doesn't matter. Uh, now, our boats have been rated in Detroit for 20 years. We got the same rating as every one of those guys. Okay. So my take on it is that we probably made the boat better than any other our boat. And maybe our rating should have been three or six seconds mile different. But we basically won the race by so much it didn't matter what we rated. Right. Which maybe has something to do with talent as well. We had uh, three fathers, three sons. But it was just conditions. I mean, we, we got the starting line. We got a perfect sail. Wind moves aft a little bit. We switched to another uh, A3, which at the time weren't that popular. People didn't have it. Once again, the perfect sail. Now it turns into a run, and we put up a regular spinnaker. We get a couple of shifts. We jive, and we get up Sunday morning. We're the lead boat of the fleet. I mean, we're ahead of J44s wow. and stuff. So, you know, every once in a while, you know, it just happens. Right. It, 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 it was a perfect storm. It was a weird feeling because typically in a Mackinac race, you, you've got to make four, five, six good decisions. If you make them all correct, you'll win. If you make four of the six correct, you might win. In this case, everything hit. You know, all six times we were in the right place. You have actually done it. Uh, a lot of them. Okay. Uh, I've done, I think, 52 Port Hurons and about 45 Chicago's. When you have this, say the name again so I don't miss the pronounce it. Bernina. Bernina. When you look at Bernina as a boat, what, the 1920s? Uh, yeah, it was actually about 1923 it was launched. When you look at the design of this boat, and we have several boats in this lake that, have, that are of that vintage. Right. Sail design really hasn't changed all that much. I mean, they were pretty brilliant guys back then. But it's a good boat. It's a really good boat. I mean, you think about that now, 97 years later. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. A lot of uh, what control boat design is the rule. And that boat was built to the universal rule, which is the same rule that they use for 6 meters, 8 meters, 12 meters, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And that encourages really nice sailing boats. Uh, first, we had the IOR rule around here for a while. They encouraged boats that were tippy. IOR is so the International nice. Offshore Rule. Okay. And it was in place for about 20 years. Most of the perf boats that are sailing around the Detroit were built to that rule. Uh, it encouraged boats for tippy. That's not good. It encouraged uh, boats that were beamy uh, for their length. Right. That's not good. Uh, so there's a lot of characteristics that you had to build to to be competitive under that rule didn't make good boats. Um, and I'll give you an example. My father built a boat in 1963 called the Flying Buffalo. And that was built to the CCA rule, or the Cruising Club uh, of America rule. 
which basically encouraged very nice sailing boats. So we're still winning with that boat 60 years later. So when you have good rules, you have good boats. And good boats win almost under any rule. Do you still have any? No, we donated or needed to the uh, Michigan Maritime Museum that's uh, over in South Haven. Uh, when you own a wood boat, you either have to commit to spending hundreds of hours, thousands of hours every year just to keep it at its current state from getting worse, um, or get rid of it. Right. Uh, you know, you've got a member here, Rich Marsh, that's got an old wood boat. Yeah. Those guys work on that boat, work on that boat. We've been here in six as well, it's in, in the harbor here. Yeah. And, and same thing, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's not, it's more than a labor law, it's, a, it's almost a slave driven, just sort of always on it, always working it, and it's just it's a lot It was work. fine once, for, right. for four months on Bernina. Right. But I'm done with that. Right. I like the sale, I don't like the scrum stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. No, and that's what we get to look at. I mean, we get to see the history of it. Right. So they got something in South Haven's got the museum up here. It's really cool. It's cool, and they have done everything that we didn't have time to do. You know, we need the boat fast. We made the boat strong. They've made it pretty. Oh, well, that's, that's mm -hmm. a little bit. We sit here, I'm mean, just change story as we get towards the end of this thing. We sit here inside of a garage because we didn't want the wind sounds, but we're sitting across from each other, right? Um, you have been very vocal about sailing and where the rules are in the summer, and do you see us getting back to normal this summer? Yeah, and I think we've got to figure out how to do it, and we, we've got to do it smart. Uh, that uh, we've got roughly a third of the sailors are like, rah, rah, let's go. They were out there racing yesterday, they were out there racing Thursday night races and things, and they're ready to go right now. And they're ready to go with or without masks, with or without full crews. Then we got the middle third that really want to go racing. They love racing, but they're not sure they should. Right. And they want to make sure it's right. They don't want to get anybody sick. And then we got that final third. Those guys just aren't going sailing until August. Uh, and, you know, it's just the way life is. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how to make the middle third, third feel comfortable. You pointed out that these little neck gator things which are pretty cool yeah. because they're, they're comfortable, you can pull them up over your mouth. Uh, although I warned everybody that I was out sailing the other night and I got splashed by a wave. And it was like I got waterboarded. I, I panicked. Really? Yeah, because I'm not used to right. it. You know, I don't think I panic now, right. but I had a line in my hand and I was sure. doing something else. Sure, sure. And, and I can't breathe. And last week we had some serious wind. Yeah. You just, my so son, my son. I finally reached up, I poked down. Now I'm fine. Right. So for, for all of you that, that want to wear these things, keep in mind that that can happen and be ready. Uh, but uh, I think what we, the, the smart answer is to do some short-handed sailing. You know, this double-handed races, you know, I think it was really bad that the DRYA and some of the clubs canceled the racing. They should have turned it all into double-handed racing. Then we just ran a Thursday night series of debut where if we had a 20-footer, you had two people. 30 foot or three people, 40 foot or four people on board, main and chip racing, because you can't main and chip race a 44 foot or two people. Uh, we, we did it for 20 last week for siblings. Yeah. Right. It was passed over by a couple of clubs and we picked it up. And it was, we had, I think, 18 or 19 boats. The kids had a great time. We had eight races. We got one beautiful day with, with the wind. And our argument with coming with junior sailing at the moment is what do we do with two kids from other houses sitting on a boat? And, but right now, the law doesn't allow us to put two kids on the 420. Right. And then if you want kids that, that well, we signed up for 420s, but we're going to flip the lasers. What laser fleet we had, we got rid of it because it was, they were all water and old, right. and nobody wants to go out and spend 600 bucks. I still work with the, the guys at Bayview, and I think that a couple of good things are going to come out of this. One is for 10 years, I thought that uh, we spent way much, too much time on logistics, moving boats around from Regattas to Regattas. So once we fire up Junior Sailing in Detroit here, the current plan is for everybody just to sail out to the little club, sail their races, eat their lunch on their boats, and sail back to try and minimize the interaction. What we're going to find out is we're going to get more racing in, more coaching in, and less logistics. This is the format Detroit should have been using in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be a good thing that's going to come out of it. And I'm not worried at all about the kids. 
who I'm worried about is the coaches and the parents. Because one, there's so much bad information out there that you can't possibly be sure of anything. But it appears like it's almost impossible to catch this thing outside. So you and I, a foot apart outside, is probably safer than us being four feet apart inside. But some of that misinformation, I'm, I'm, I've said I've known two calls from DYRA's junior center, right? And you have two doctors working at the same hospital or the same hospital system with diametrically opposed opinions. So who do you believe? Well, they don't know. No, no, but that's my point. Yeah. That's my point. It's, it's so convoluted, it's, it's hard to make decisions. This is, this is just too little. We yeah. have two people, say you and me, one of us gets this, we never knew we had it. Right. The other one gets it, and three days later we're on our deathbed. Right. So th th there's a lot that doctors don't know. Uh, but what everybody seems to be in agreement in is that we can get a little bit of spacing, and we're outside in the sunshine, we're probably pretty safe. One of the things that in my involvement with Junior Center is having been a coach, and still am a coach at the college level, watching it for the first year as an organizer and as a director here, there's just a lot of things that didn't make sense to me. You spent 75% of your time racing and 25% of your time practicing. Then when you didn't really want to do a race anymore, you put the kids in Easter League and take them for a ride. Well, how much sailing? Like we've had this conversation with almost everybody that's talked about it. We have a bay over here. Let the kids go out and sail in the bay. Put a couple of boats out there to make sure. And let them go for an hour and just have fun. Just go sail. So I'm a pretty big fan. And when I first got involved in junior sailing 15 years ago, it was race, race, race. So you're basically driving these kids. And because the kids were an extension of their parents, and the better the yes. kids did, the parents were all better. And I kept saying, guys, we've got to make it fun. And what we had is a high burnout. The people who go through junior programs, they go to collegiate racing, and there was this, just think of one time, it's probably pretty close right now, 53% of collegiate sailor racers quit sailing when they left college. Bang, these are the best we have. And they quit because the kids pushed them in Optimus, and then 420s, and then lasers, and then uh, it, there was never emphasis on having fun. And my argument was that if they had fun, they come back. Yeah. And the more they sail, the better they get. And eventually they get there. And the kid that was in a fun focus program, by the time that they were 16, might be as good a sailor as the kid that was in a no fun program by the time they were 14. But the 16, the guy that took longer was a sailor for life, and the other kid was going to quit. So I think these junior programs, I mean, you can teach skills by uh, racing, or we can put the kids out with an optimist and toss 20 water balloons in the water, the one that collects the most wins. Right. So they learn the same skills either way, but one way is fun. But I'm guessing you had as a junior, had more time in the boat by yourself, sort of sailing in Tom Sawyer and just out there having a good time than the kids have now. It's so organized now and you can't, we don't give them any time to just go, you know, a little girl that our rock got last year, she, got, she thought it was really cool, she caught a couple wind, and she's going in a circle. And her mom was all freaked out. I said, let her go, why? And she said, anyway, how can it possibly matter? Let her have fun. Yeah, and that's kind of the point. And when they walk off, and if you look at, if you go back to federation numbers of all sports, that's that from a high school perspective, you know, our burnout race is close to 60% collectively for sport. Because we've made it a job. We haven't made it. The average high school kid right now who plays two sports, and he has his regular academic load, we're asking him to work 65 hours a week. Now, if I listen to the parent, by the way, next week you're working 65 hours at your job, you're going to tell me to go blow it out my nose. Right. I mean, it's just, it's, it has to change. It has to be. Yeah, so I think we need to be more fun focused. And, you know, we're just trying to accommodate everybody. And that's how some of this uh, logistics gets in place. Right. And at some point, we just have to step back and say, what's best for 80% of the kids? And do that. And if it isn't quite as good for 20% of the kids, so what? With your expertise, here's the, here's the question I have. I, I, I haven't had a chance to ask uh, this one only once. We have optimists, which are a little slow, obviously, you know what optimists is. Right. And we've got 420s. We've had, Mike like Common is the, the baby's director. Right. We've had a number of conversations. Mike and I are having conversations about what's the intermediate vote between an optimist and a 420. You think there should be, number one, and if there is, what would you, what would you think? Well, we, we, we tried those little bits. Uh, and that maybe was a good solution because you get kids that, uh, 
size out of an Oculus, but they're not ready for a laser, maybe they're not ready for a 420. Uh, in general, you see the bit? The, the, yeah, these little bits, they're, they're pretty cool, they're cheap, they're uh, molded boats, um, uh, pretty indestructible, uh, a bit squirrely uh, is a problem for some kids, but you know, it's more like skateboarding than sailing. Okay. But so sort of kids can handle it. Sure. But if you look at the southern hemisphere now, they're doing these really cool boats. They're doing octi-size uh, multi-hulls. They're six feet long, and they're doing some uh, spiffs and that type of thing. And there's a reason why, in general, sailing has fallen behind America because we're sailing these same lousy boats that we've been sailing for the last 35 years. How we change? It's about money. Okay. You know, Crescent's got a whole fleet of these things. Baby dust, close right. got club dust. We're invested. Right. You know, for us to go on out and buy one of these nice. new Melchus 15s, right. and for all the clubs to go buy them, it isn't going to happen. Now, in the Opti case, there's an argument for as bad a boat as that is. But it's a good trainer. Right. Plus, it's going to go all over. Right. All over. Right. But I don't know that there's any argument, period, for sale of 420s. I, I keep looking at UFOs, you know, because of the, you look at the World Cup, you look at the Grand Prix, and you think, well, are we headed towards racing in this world? Well, so, I mean, obviously the world is. Right. Should the kids learn at some point of having a couple of UFOs or something similar? To that? I think they should. You know, it gives them a different perspective. It'll be more fun. They're certainly fast. Yeah. They're certainly fast. Yeah, and the kids are capable of anything. Yeah. Yeah. Think there'll be a Mac on ship? Yes. I think he'd put that at about 99.9%. Do you think the Mac will look anything like it has in the previous 90 years? No. Okay. So, for obviously, that we've been told as of today that the boats can dock in the harbor. There's going to be some restrictions on um, uh, rafting, right. which I think we all expect. Uh, you know, the, the horns and pink pony is not going to be what it's been in the past. That they're, they're only going to be allowed 25% occupancy. So, do we on the island? Like the guys talking to Ryan Farrell. And Chris Clark about that yesterday. And we would like to do the awards on the island. Uh, but we got social distancing on it, you know. Yeah. Even if the government doesn't enforce it, they think the clubs need to enforce it. Uh, that uh, uh, we need to keep our clusters down of people, and we need to have some spacing. And if we're not all willing to do that, we're all getting upset. You know, so I'm a fan of doing everything, but doing it smart. Right. Well, listen, this has been a really good interview. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, I'd shake your hand and any no, other. No, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sure we're probably five inches, five feet, six inches. But I just think it's it's been really fun to listen and have these conversations with folks. What we try to do is make a conversation so that if you're a really smart racer and you really know all about sailing, you enjoy it. But I think the majority of folks that are sailing on this lake, there's probably more folks like me than like you. I think there's a lot of people who own sailboats who just love to sail. They want to learn more. I think that's kind of part well, of the kind this of This has been fun for me. And you know, my wife said, hey, well, what are you guys going to talk about? I said, I don't know. And uh, she said, well, don't you prep? I said, no, we're just going to go talk. Yeah. That's why it's called conversation. You know, it's, it's that, the whole process of it. And it's just, it's, it's informative. Again, you try to make the, 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 the audience enjoy something. You know, kind of thing. And there's been some really fun stories out of it, and I've learned a ton. The one thing I've learned, and, and something you probably already know, is that I'm just amazed. Having joined this club now, and here this is my fourth year, it's just amazing how much talent is here. And I say that I coach skiing at the USSA level, at a mid and a, a custom level, which is just slightly short of the national team. So I know what good stuff looks like. And then I start having conversations, and I thought I was a pretty adequate sailor. And then I came to Crescent. I realized, oh my God. And uh, true with baby, true with, you know, well, there's, there's some really good folks. There's good sailors here that nobody knows anything. Yes, yes. yes. And, you know, you asked if at uh, a time earlier, you know, why choose one sailmaker over another sailmaker? Well, maybe a similar question is why choose one yacht club over right. another one? And somebody says, well, what's the best yacht club? They said, there is no best yacht club. What fit? Said, yeah, it's, it's your fit. And what I always encourage people is that. Uh, don't just do something because your neighbor thinks it's the best one. Go figure out what's best for you. And that's sound advice. And on that sound advice, I will uh, want to thank you for visiting with us. 
And uh, for everybody uh, behind the scenes, we will be back uh, with another, another interview soon. For on the clerk, my name is Ray Moore. We'll see you next week. I hope to invite you back next year. Mm -hmm.